So we're here at the Lift uh, Geneva, and uh, uh, what is the latest news here at the, at the CERN? What's going on? So the latest news from CERN is that our new particle physics facility, the Large Hadron Collider, is finally up and running. It started in March last year. It's been delivering data ever since. We've started analysing that data, giving us snapshots of the first billionths of a second of after the Big Bang in the universe, and we're trying to make sense of it. So far, what we've seen sort of matches our expectations, and we're looking for the stuff that might explain more about the universe right now. It's very exciting. So, so far you've been running at kind of like half power? That's right. And so you're, you're going to speed up? Energy. And we're going to be running at that energy for the next two years in order to get a large sample of data where we can really sort of spin through it and look for new effects and be sure that we're doing the best job we can there. And then we shut down for a year and we... It's like a car maintenance, you know, your, your big car service. Everything gets fixed, checked again, and then we start up at higher energies where is, our reach can go further out. Is it running non-stop right now? It's in a, in a winter break or...? Right now it's coming to the end of the Christmas holidays. So right now we're doing electrical tests, turning it back on again. We expect first beams 20th of February, 21st of February, something like that. So not long. So 20th of February immediately goes full speed or gradually? <laughs> No, we, we turn it on, we're going to be running at the same energies as last year, and um, probably the same intensities as we stopped last year. And then we carry on ramping up the intensities, getting them sort of stronger and stronger, putting more protons in the beam, getting more data out again. Does that, it run like day and night? We're talking 24 hours here. Yeah. We have teams of physicists controlling machines and the experiments who take eight hour shifts around the clock to keep it all going. No, once this starts, we don't want to stop, so we just man it continuously. And uh, so, so basically you're using as much, as much power as the whole city of Geneva, no? Not quite. I think when no? everything is switched on and yeah. using peak power, it's something like a third, but it's like it's comparable. You're, you're quite right. Is that the reason why it's not running in the winter? Because Geneva needs more power? or? But that always used to be the reason why CERN never ran particle accelerators in the winter, because they came to a special deal with the electricity suppliers that they would get it slightly cheaper in the summer when there was an excess, and then in the winter when other people wanted it, you know, we'd stand back and keep our hands off it. But now, with the LHC, we are we don't run over Christmas because we use that as a time when we can make do maintenance and have a small shutdown. But we, we start up again a little earlier in February. And all right, electricity is a little bit cheaper. But we we try not to use as much as we can. So we use magnets. Our magnets use a technology which is superconducting. That actually uses less electricity to keep it going than the sorts of magnets we used to use in the past. So we're very aware of the costs of electricity. We're trying to minimise our footprints. I think it would be fine. Uh, Geneva should just shut down that and stop using electricity, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm sure people living in Geneva would have something to say about that. So, so you mentioned there's 9,000 uh, scientists working on there and basically the best uh, uh, physicist, uh, physics scientist in the world, right? Well, we're talking about something like a quarter of the world's particle physicists are involved in some way or other with, with part of the LHC. The, one of the experiments there, or maybe the accelerator as well, or maybe the theories behind it, or the computing science. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge collaborative industry of many different disciplines. So, but how can you collaborate? How, how can you make sure that everybody is happy and, and be, being able to do what they want and stuff? How does it organize? It's a very, very strange management situation. You're, you're talking of an experiment that involves maybe 3,000 collaborators from all over the world with different working environments and ethics. And everybody basically wants to look for the same stuff. And everybody, because we're physicists, wants to find that, for, that stuff first and find it themselves. And we're always a little arrogant as physicists and think we can do things better. So if you can imagine 3,000 of us in a room all convinced that we can make a measurement better than the next person, it could be a nightmare. We could go nowhere. But what makes the difference for us is having an environment which is very open so everybody in an experiment has access to the data, has access to everything that goes on, has an equal say in it. And everybody's motivated by the same underlying goal, which is really a desire to understand the universe. And that overrides any sort of petty concerns or politics that you might have on a day-to-day -day level. So there's open competition, like uh, open yes. source work. Oh, yes. 100%. Nobody's hiding anything. No, 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 no. Everyone does the best job they can. They come together. They discuss the, the, re the relative merits of their approaches. You know, we fight a little to understand it better. We combine the best approaches into one better, better approach. No, it works like that. It's a little combative, maybe, but it, it gets out the best result in the end. And you mentioned that uh, there's a competitor in the US doing something? 
That's right. How far are they going to be in, and how, well, how, how is that comparable? This is interesting. So the facility in America is called the Tevatron. It's America's version of the Large Hadron Collider, but it's, it runs at slightly lower energies, and it's been running for a while now. And it has the same potential, to, to um, even a little better, to discover something about the Higgs in the next year. But it's come to the end of its lifetime. This year is the last amount of data that's ever going to be delivered by that facility. And at that point, the LHD goes on, goes further, says more. So it's just at this overlap point when it's really quite nice, actually. We have two facilities, quite independent, that might be able to give us information in the next year. And then one shuts down and the baton is handed over to the LHC and Europe takes it further. Although in practice most of us are involved in the Tevatron and the LHC because the particle physics world is quite small. So this is the year where everything might happen? It is. That's why it's yeah. so exciting. It really is a very, very exciting time. We don't often have... 2011. 2011 is, and 2012, these are the years when we get that data that should tell us really whether we understand the universe in the way we think we do, or whether we've been conning ourselves and we have to think about it in a completely different way. It's, it's a, it really is a sort of watershed moment for our subject and for fundamental science. It doesn't, these moments don't come along very often. Do you, do you think it might be super fast at getting into commercial products as well? There Some are spin-offs, there are spin-off smart technology, not, not from the science that we find out. I mean, that's, that goes into mankind's sort of horizon and knowledge of the universe. But the technologies we have to develop to get to the science are very useful. So accelerators, most of them are not in particle physics experiments, they are in hospitals being used in medical scanning. Antimatter, I, I've talked about that. Antimatter has a real-life use, which is in PET scanning. PET scanners use antimatter as the source that you can then use to image cancerous tumors. The technology we developed for our detectors is used for imaging, retinal imaging, um, security scanning devices. The web was developed at CERN in the 1990s. I know we always say this, but it, you know, <laughs> no harm reminding people. Yeah. You just can't tell what's going to come out of the sort of stuff that we do, because it, it's blue skies research. And we're buried in one end of it, trying to get out to the science. It just needs someone to step back and look at what we've developed and what we've done and say, well, hang on a minute, that would be a really good solution for this problem over here. And then it's like wildfire, it takes off. So have a look in 20 years, 50 years, that's okay. all I can say. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay.